Hey, hey. Good evening to our listeners and viewers, and welcome to the Kiva News Candidate Forum with those in the bidding for Humboldt County's 5th Supervisorial District for the June 2022 primary election, with vote-by-mail ballots expected to be mailed out in the coming days. Humboldt County's 5th District includes Fieldbrook, Hoopa, Corbell, McKinleyville, Orleans, Oric, Trinidad, Wichpeck, West Haven, and Willow Creek. Residents in those cities and unincorporated towns will vote for either incumbent Steve Majerone or candidate Larry Doss. The candidate who receives 50% plus one of the vote by June 7th will serve as the fifth district's representative for the next four years. The board enacts legislation governing Humboldt County and determines overall policies for county departments and various special districts, adopts the annual budget and fixes salaries. The board also hears appeals of planning commission decisions and considers general plan amendments. As of 2019, the yearly salary for the position is $95,000. Tonight, local nonprofits will be asking candidates a variety of questions relevant to their mission. The groups include the Eureka chapter of the NAACP, Centro del Pueblo, the Humboldt and Del Norte Central Labor Council, the North Coast People's Alliance, Cooperation Humboldt, Healthcare for All, Humboldt Physicians for a National Health Program, the North Coast Environmental Center, Affordable Homeless Housing Alternatives, the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities, the Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaborative, Humboldt Area Center for Harm Reduction, 350 Humboldt, Queer Humboldt, and the Redwood Coalition for Climate and Environmental Responsibility. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question, followed by a one minute rebuttal, which which will be allotted to each candidate. I would like to note that KMUD is a neutral entity and we do not endorse or promote any individual candidate, political party or ideal. It is our mission to inform, educate and inspire our listening community. We are coming to you live on KMUD radio and have a live video stream on the KMUD news Facebook page. Starting at 7 p.m., members of the public are invited to submit questions by calling the station at 707-923-3911, or you can submit your questions on the Cayman News Facebook page. Before we get going, I would like to thank our engineer, Javier Rodriguez, our tech support, Brian Christensen, our timekeeper, Stella Gerkins, and Caroline Griffin for helping to organize this event that gives the public the opportunity to participate in democracy. Now, I would like to open the floor to our candidates for a brief three-minute intro as to who you are, starting with candidate Larry Doss. We'll start the clock. Hi, thank you, and uh, good evening to uh, all your listeners as well. My name is Larry Doss. I am a uh, 52-year resident of Humboldt County. My folks moved me here when I was four years old, and I have never left. I've found... uh, uh, full education through uh, everywhere from kindergarten through uh, two years of college. I've owned two businesses and I've got, I've raised three kids. They're all adults and out of high school. And uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is making opportunities for our youth to find living wage careers here in Humboldt County and be able to stay if they choose. And as a parent, I'm, I'm a little bit biased towards that. Um, I love Humboldt County. I uh, uh, want to see it remain a beautiful rural lifestyle. I believe strongly in uh, private property rights and individual rights to make their own, uh, uh, individuals make their own decisions and not be forced with mandates, uh, whether it's health or other issues. Um, So personal freedom, property rights, uh, and just be able to uh, help facilitate Humboldt County be, continue to be an enjoyable place to live and uh, have fun being here. So thank you. Okay, and Steve Madrone, we'll start the clock. A quick intro, uh, let folks know who you are. Uh, thank you, Lauren, and uh, thank you, KMUD listeners, for being here tonight. I think this is going to be an exciting couple of hours, and uh, as, as always, KMUD is bringing things forward to us, to inform us, to educate us, and help us be responsible residents of Humboldt County. Uh, I've lived in uh, Humboldt County for 49 years, and I 
have lived in the fifth district for 46 years. So I know the people, I know the areas, I know to who, who to go to when we need to get things done and all the various communities around the fifth district. The fifth district is very large. It's almost, uh, well, it's two fifths, almost half of the county. It's basically everything north and east of the Mad River. And it includes everywhere all the way up through Oric, almost to Klamath, up the, uh, and east out to Willow Creek, all the way up to Witchpeck and Orleans. And it also goes all the way down the Mad River to Maple Creek. So it's a very large district with a very diverse community. I know it well, and I'm very proud and honored to have served as the supervisor for the last four years. I have a tremendous amount of background in watershed management and land use planning. And I bring those skills to the board in order to help us make all the very difficult decisions that we have in front of us these days. I'm proud to be endorsed by all of the electeds in the area, including Congressman Huffman, Senator McGuire, Assemblyman Wood, most of the unions in Humboldt County, uh, as well as the retired electeds, electeds like Wesley Chesbrill, Julie Fulkerson, and others, but also the unions, the working people support me. And uh, most of those unions have endorsed me, uh, many, many community members. And I'm also very honored to have been endorsed by all three of our local tribes in the fifth district, Hoopa, Karuk, and the Yurok tribes. I'm a bridge builder. Anybody that knows me knows that I work hard to reach out to both sides of issues and bring people together on common ground. You know, where do we have issues that we find common ground that we can move forward on to help our community thrive, be safe, and, and move forward. Um, I'm part of the new party. It's called the GSD party or get stuff done party basically. And, and I think I have the skills to do that. I've shown that in my work over the last 40 some years in Humboldt, as well as in my term on uh, the supervisors. I'm, I'm very focused on housing, jobs while also protecting the environment. Seconds. Thank you. Oh, okay, 30 seconds. Well, anyway, I think I've said mostly what I wanna say except the most important part and that is I am a grandpa of 20 with six adopted foster kids. Both my daughters have adopted and I have one great grandchild. So the future of Humboldt County matters a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to one of the local nonprofits, the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. Um, Ryan, who's here doing tech support, some of these nonprofits recorded videos. We're gonna go to that video right now. I'm Colin Fisk, Executive Director of CRTP, the Coalition for Responsible Transportation Priorities. And this question is from CRTP and the North Coast Environmental Center. Humboldt County's Regional Transportation Plan and Comprehensive Action Plan for Energy, as well as the forthcoming Climate Action Plan, all call for significantly reducing the amount of driving in the county. What will you do to ensure that the county meets these adopted targets and reduces the role of cars in our communities? Okay, Supervisor Madrone, we're gonna go to you for this first one, uh, two minutes. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, well, that's a great question, right? It's on our, all of our minds. Uh, climate change is real and we need to deal with it. Um, you know, some of the ways we deal with that is uh, through improved uh, land use and, and planning. We've adopted an updated general plan and now we need to apply the zoning as part of that update. But in the process, what we're looking is trying to do a lot of infill where services already exist. And, and that provides a lot better way to provide transit and increased multimodal uh, transportation uh, with safe passage for pedestrians, as well as motorcycle going by, as well as uh, having safe opportunities for bicyclists. So I've been working on those things all over Humboldt County for a long time, like the Hammond Trail. We're currently working on a project in South McKinleyville to increase multimodal transportation there. We've been doing a transit study. Uh, I'm also working with the Yurok tribe and the county Humble, uh, Humble Transit Authority to bring back the bus transit uh, between Willow Creek, Hoopa, Witchpeck, and even down river up there and up to Orleans. So there's a lot we can do in that arena, but it also comes down to the kinds of housing projects we bring forward that we need to make sure they're being electrified 
so that we can shift over to electric vehicles as that technology is getting better and better. We also need to be uh, protecting our forest lands and our watersheds. And we do that through land use planning and trying to make sure that seconds. trying to make sure that the bulk of our new housing and the rest of it happens where we already have services, where we can be more efficient, where people can walk and, and bicycle to the store and to uh, all the things they need to do in their community. And Larry Doss, same question. And I just want to let you both know that if you need me to repeat um, one of those questions, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, so there's there's a lot of issues in the air uh, aside from just limiting transportation. I'll try to stay more focused on on the transportation question. Um, one of the one of the uh, I believe grounding principles is going to be with me is going to be to be careful not to limit uh, uh, transportation so much that it will harm uh, our rural lifestyles and the and the folks that are living their lifestyles living in the far outreaches of the county because it's very difficult to uh, to drive miles and miles of, uh, of of gravel or dirt roads and expect to have public transportation close so. Um, that's got to be in our minds as a, a very critical issue to not isolate people. And, that, and I believe that could be dangerous. Um, and then uh, uh, I believe also that our transportation questions of, of how to uh, green them up more and get, get rid of um, internal combustion uh, modes of transportation is going to come with technology. And uh, I'm I'm an avid uh, reader of um, uh, the outlets that that share what's going on with technology. There's an exciting company in Sacramento that uh, is using a plant-based uh, fuel that uh, can replace yeah, it can replace uh, diesel and jet fuel. So I, I believe technology, given a little bit of time, is going to help uh, with those answers coming at us. Steve Madrone, one minute. Thank you. Yeah, you know, those are all important things. Uh, but the bottom line is climate change is real. And we don't have a lot of time to react. We really need to be pushing rapidly with the changes, with the technology we have. And there is fantastic technology already available to us. So it really comes down to us putting our, ourselves out there and making sure we get these things done now, not later. Well, we've had a lot of time to make these changes, but now is the time to be doing that and moving forward on all the new technologies we already have. There's a lot of ways to make that happen. Thank you. Larry Doss, one minute. So getting to my point, I uh, believe technology is, is around the corner. It's going to be there. It's sad to see that uh, we make things appear to be more green in, in America, yet we allow large strip mines in Africa and China to uh, to happen just to get lithium for batteries. So I, I believe the technology is going to take some of those issues away from us and uh, will be a whole uh, picture of green for the whole planet. Thank you both. We're going to go to our next question, which comes from the Affordable Homeless Housing Alternatives, or AHA. And we're going to go to Ryan's screen to do so. Good evening. Thank you for participating in the forum tonight. My name is Nessie Wade, and I am the president of the board for Affordable Homeless Housing Alternatives. And uh, my question is precipitated by the fact that we don't have affordable housing in Humboldt County. Affordable sheltering could be implemented locally. What actions will you to support the implementation of the alternatives of safe parking? legal campsites, and tiny house villages for our unhoused community members. Okay, and Larry Doss, we're gonna to go to you for this question, two minutes. Great, Great. This, is, this is one of my top priorities is to handle uh, the homeless issue and provide real quality options for the community that is homeless. Um, one of the things that, uh, 
is, is a new pro, uh, project just about rolling out with the county is called the Navigation Center that is underway. Um, and that project, uh, hopefully we'll see that built by the end of this year, uh, maybe first of next. Um, there's gonna be multiple, multiple projects that um, I'm, I'm looking forward to rolling my sleeves up and getting involved in. So DHHS is on that right now and they've got that option going, plus they're looking at others. Um, then affordable housing can also be solved with, uh, affordable housing and sheltering can be solved with a, a great partnership, a public private partnership, um, first by just allowing um, some infill and uh, be more smart uh, with our, our planning and building as far as uh, options that we don't typically see right now in Humboldt County, but infill with uh, multiple levels, um, uh, infill and tiny houses are, are relatively easy. I've seen a little tiny house project in McKinleyville that looks very successful, has great, great track record, but there's a lot of different options. And because, you know, everyone's a little bit different, um, 30 seconds. Not, not every homeless uh, project, uh, solution project, is going to fit all. So we have to be flexible and malleable with that. And Steve Madrone, same question, two minutes. A great question. Thank you, Nezi, and all the work that AHA does in our community. Affordable sheltering, safe parking, sanctioned camps, these are all part of the puzzle. Uh, you know, there are three primary things that we have to think about when we're trying to help provide homeless uh, individuals housing and help remove this. Uh, housing insecurity that's all over our community and the state, if not the whole country. The first thing is having more funds to be able to make things happen. And luckily we're in a period right now where the state and the federal government are putting a lot more funds into this. The second thing is to have good partners. Uh, the way it typically works is there's some fantastic workers in the Department of Health and Human Services here at the county or DHHS, but they rely a lot on partners, nonprofit partners, as well as uh, uh, church partners and others, and they step up and help us deliver these programs. What we need to be able to do is provide advanced payments for those partners, as well as rapid turnaround on the payments from the county. Uh, when we don't do that, it makes it very difficult for the partners to step up. The third thing that we need is locations, and that's the most difficult part of this. But we already have a tremendous amount of camps all over the county and we're spending about 60 to $100,000, according to Senator McGuire and Sheriff Hansel, uh, for every homeless person per year, 60 to $100,000. And that's not on solving the problem, that's on emergency rooms, hospital visits, all kinds of environmental damage, other problems in the community. And so I believe that if we take that money and we move it up front, we're gonna do a lot better and we can work with communities with empathy, find places where we can provide sanctioned camps, safe parking with good services and help people move into programs and things to help them with whatever they're experiencing. So I've been working with Hoopal Valley to get the modular plant back up. And Sorry about that. Larry Doss, one minute. Thank you. So uh, the, the real issue with housing too is that we need to provide housing of, affordable on multiple levels and um, when you do that, it helps to move people through the housing chain of our life, and uh, that that opens up the market. So that's how private industry, private practice can can help. Uh, also, there's there's plenty of private partners that I've worked with that are very interested in um, providing facilities that are various in in types. Uh, some RV related parking, um, some uh, condominium and actually offer the ability for those folks that are looking for housing to become future homeowners. So lots of options out there and um, we just need to be, be broad in, in looking at those options and considering them. And Steve Madrone, one minute. Uh, I was glad to be able to test the mute button there. You guys are good. That's a fair debate when you cut us off right when we get there. Thank you. So very quickly, uh, as I said, the Hoopa modular plant I've been working with the tribe to get that back up and running and they can be producing a tremendous amount of tiny homes in our community, which is part of the solution. As a board, we also passed a new housing element about two years ago that makes incentivizes tiny home 
uh, ADUs or accessory dwelling units, detached bedrooms, and many other types of small and affordable housing. Uh, we're also going to be adding a tremendous amount of housing in McKinsey with our town center planning. We know we already have a housing problem. HSU is going to create a new demand with Cal Poly. And so we have a lot of work to do. And I agree that private and public partnerships is how we get there and make all of that happen. We need to have a lot of empathy. Okay. And I believe that brings us to our next question by Cooperation Humboldt. Ryan. I'm Lorna Bryant of Cooperation Humboldt. Participatory budgeting is a democratic process in which community members directly decide how to spend part of a public budget. By giving communities real decision-making power in a collaborative process, participatory budgeting can strengthen ties between citizens and officials. Earlier this year, the city of Arcata successfully conducted a participatory budgeting pilot project in partnership with Cooperation Humboldt. If elected, will you commit to working with community agencies to employ a participatory budgeting pilot project at the county level? Thank you. Okay, Steve Madrone, we're gonna go to you for, for this one. You bet, well, that's another great question. I think we're gonna hear a lot of good ones tonight. Um, participatory budgeting is a fantastic thing. I've long, long thought that when we do our tax returns, it'd be really nice if there were a set of boxes there and you say, I want this much to go to the schools. I want this much to go to housing. I want, you know, but that's not there. As a county, we used to have a very vigorous uh, participatory budgeting process. We had the road show that we went out, but COVID put an end to that. Now is the time to bring that back because we're all hopeful that we're moving out of COVID. We're starting to have in-person meetings again, and that's absolutely a requirement, and I will push for that. I am committed to making sure that we have a participatory budgeting process, and I agree completely that it does strengthen ties when people have that direct access to their supervisors, to elected officials, to department heads, to tell us what you think the priorities are for these budgets. We get a lot of money that comes in. There's a lot more money out there, and we need to be able to go after that. And I've been supporting adding staff specifically that are professional grant writers so that we can take advantage of much of that tax money that we put out there and help bring that tax money home and spend it on those things that the community is telling us that they'd like to see happen. Um, so that's something I'm very committed to. And how much time do I have left? <laughs> Oh, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, sorry, sorry. 30 seconds, okay. So yeah, it's something that's been missing and I'm, I'm gonna be talking to our CAO and others about how we bring back that process in a vigorous way. So I, I appreciate the question, thank you. Okay, Mr. Larry Doss, uh, the same question on participatory budgeting and working with cooperation on board. Great, oh, I, I love it. Anytime we can uh, bring more people involved into decision-making, in local government, it makes it stronger, makes better buy-in on the decisions. It, it really sets the county up for services to be extremely successful. Um, and I, I just think it's even uh, got good, good legs to bring a positive morale booster uh, to the county uh, staff. So I, I, I see it as a plus all the way around. I do not see a negative to it. I'd love to, uh, uh, see us use that that form of budgeting. I did like also the uh, the roadshow uh, prior to COVID, and I think the outreach into the community. Anytime we can get more people, more eyes looking on budgets, the smarter we get. And Steve Madrone, one minute. Uh, no need for rebuttal. I think we're fine. We'll save some time. Mm. Larry, is there anything else you'd like to add with your minute? Okay, nope, we're good. moving on. Our next nonprofit is the Humboldt Area Center for Harm Reduction. Again, we'll go to Ryan. My name is Jasmine Guerra and I'm the executive director with the Humboldt Area Center for Harm Reduction. And I'm going to present a few of our questions. 
Um, the first question is that the pandemic has proven to worsen the health needs of people who use drugs and people experiencing homelessness in our community. We're looking for a candidate who will prioritize the well being of the people who are most vulnerable to preventable and premature deaths. How will you support the life saving services of harm reduction, overdose prevention, and advocacy for people who use drugs and or people experiencing homelessness in our community? The second question is about um, uh, fentanyl in our community. Um, in the past year, as a reaction to an increasing number of overdose deaths, we've seen elected officials push towards the narrative of wanting to convict people who sell fentanyl to be charged with murder if the sale can be linked to an overdose. This tactic is harmful and it worsens the negative effects of the war on drugs. Do you have an opinion on the matter? And if so, what is it? And the third question that we have is, do you support the reallocation of funds from police departments to community-based programs that support people who use drugs and or people experiencing homelessness? Thank you. Okay, there was a lot there. So we're gonna go ahead and give each candidate three minutes for this one. And we're gonna start with you, Larry Doss. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there was a lot there. So, um, uh, and this, this kind of ties in with what we were talking about earlier with the homeless issue, the most vulnerable population uh, being exposed to the elements. And also uh, uh, they have a high use of, um, of medical services, emergency medical services, which uh, kind of um, creates a, a, uh, a wear on our emergency medical services across the whole population. So uh, a solution there would be fantastic. And I believe there are solutions there. I believe uh, uh, Connie Beck at DHHS, uh, like I said earlier, has got that navigation center. I think we all need to pay attention to that and be rooting that on. I think that's going to be a step in the right way, in the right direction and maybe a way to uh, multiply it across the county so that it's uh, very approachable, very easy to access by that vulnerable population. Um, and then as far as advocacy, absolutely. Um, I, I plan on advocating for everybody in Humboldt County, but you know, especially the fifth district, but, but we're all humble, we're all together here. So uh, a, a vote or a decision by one supervisor will affect all. And um, definitely uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sad situation society's gotten us here, and I believe we have solutions here within Humboldt County to, to resolve. Uh, fentanyl deaths, um, I, I don't, I don't, um, in, in one way, I don't have enough information, but I, uh, off, the, off the top of my head, I'm not going to say that I uh, would agree with automatics of uh, pressing charges hard on, on uh, fentanyl deaths. I, I think you need to leave that to the district attorney to make those determinations and base those on law. And then reallocation of funds from the sheriff's department to um, projects. I am not in favor of that. I'm in favor of bolstering the sheriff's department because the sheriff's department needs uh, more boots on the ground, so to speak, right now. And I believe we can find the funds from somewhere else to handle the services to um, to provide to this population. Okay, excellent. With 30 seconds to spare. And Steve Madron, uh, three minutes for this kind of three-tiered question. Yeah, a lot of a lot of stuff packed in those three questions, and they're excellent. Um, first of all, let me just say that I think the pandemic's been really hard on all of us, but in particular, our vulnerable populations have suffered the most. That's there's no doubt about that. Um, they're out on the streets, they're in the woods, without uh, showers, without washing facilities, uh, without garbage facilities, it's, it's just horrendous. And, you know, we all were able to shelter into our homes uh, during the pandemic in the first year. But what about the people that are out on the streets? There were people that are throwing rocks at the jail in order to get arrested so they could get three square in a bed. I mean, it's that desperate. Uh, it's really, really taking a toll on that population. We need to do a lot more and yes, there are solutions and we need to implement them. So the county, as I said, we passed a new housing element and that's gonna help us with a lot of things like tiny homes and other affordable 
types of housing, but we're also on the verge of uh, reviewing and hopefully approving a new ordinance at the county, a safe uh, safe parking and sanctioned camps ordinance, ordinance so that we can find ways and places where we can provide uh, better situations for people that are literally living in the woods. Um, so that's an important part of what we need to do. Uh, fentanyl has really become a real scourge on our communities on many, many levels. It is absolutely a problem. But like any problem, it's not just a simple, well, let's just do this and it'll all go away. Um, I was asked to come out and walk with uh, a lot of Hoopa families several months ago to walk against the fentanyl use and the drug dealers in the, the reservation and in our communities. So I participated in that. I was very honored to be asked to be part of that. And we actually have an issue on our agenda tomorrow in regards to fentanyl uh, that we're gonna be uh, working through as a board of supervisors as well. Um, you know, it's not so much that we need to defund the police as much as I think we need to reprogram how we handle things. Uh, I was the supervisor who pushed very hard to make sure that we got raises for all of our deputies, uh, including all the rest of our county staff because we were understaffed. We had the money to hire people, but the wages we were paying were so low, we were not able to recruit and retain people and morale was low. And I was pleased to hear that as soon as we got that passed in January, Sheriff Hansel was on the news saying that those wage increases have absolutely helped recruit, retrain, or retain and uh, increase, increase morale. Um, so what I think we need to do, and we started getting some new funding, is to have more trained social outreach workers riding with the deputies to help with the stuff on the streets and help people get into programs if they're looking for help to be able to change their lives. So that's what I support. Thank you. Larry Doss, one minute. Uh, you bet. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm very proud of is I was recently endorsed by the Humboldt County Deputy Sheriff's Organization as well as Sheriff Billy Hansel. And one of the things that has come up in discussions with those two is, is uh, that we have not really allowed the sheriff's department to fully serve. And one of the things going back again to, uh, to what we've talked about with the homeless issues and, and, um, and, and such, I'm trying to be fast on this, this clock, uh, is that we can, we can take care of some of the, uh, the problems outside and allow the, our existing services to really uh, ramp up and, and stretch their legs and do full service to the community that they very much would like to provide. 15 seconds to spare and one minute rebuttal, uh, Steve Madrone. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting to see who supports who and who endorses who. And uh, what Larry said is true, that the deputies and the two sheriffs have endorsed him. I think that has more to do with cultural bias, frankly, than it does with actions. As I said, I was the person on the board who argued for those pay raises. And it's just kind of interesting how that stuff pans out. I think part of it is because I really demand really good service from our deputies. And I believe most all of them are incredible people that really care about the communities on many, many levels. But there are a few that you know, have caused a lot of problems. And so I've questioned that. And I think that's another reason why that support went the other way. So I'm not a person who's gonna shy away from questioning both myself, my board, and the rest of our department heads to try and provide better service to our community. Excellent, and before we go to our next question, I do wanna remind our listeners and our viewers, you gotta to tune to KMUD Garberville. This is KMUD News' live candidate forum uh, with those in the running for Humboldt County's fifth supervisorial district. And with that, we'll go to the Humboldt Del Norte Central Labor Council. Good evening, supervisor candidates. Thank you for taking the time to come to our forum and listen to our questions. My name is John Fromm and I'm the president of the Humboldt and Del Norte Central Labor Council. My question today is, taxes have become a very important issue for the regulated cannabis market. Will you support efforts underway that could give local tax credits for cannabis businesses that meet certain labor standards? For example, having a collective bargaining agreement, a state certified training program, a local hire preference? If so, how would you implement such a program? Thank you so much and have a great evening. Okay, and Supervisor Madrone, you will be starting off this round. Oh, thank you, Lauren. Um, 
Yeah, thank you, John, for the question. Um, I do support local labor and local hire. And I think that's why most all of the unions in Humboldt County have endorsed me, all of the working people uh, in the community other than the deputy sheriffs. At any rate, um, that's because I stand with labor. I've been a labor union member uh, for quite a few years. I'm not currently because I took a new job, but I am the one person at the board who's from the day I took office, been working to try and provide incentives. Um, you know, when you take economics 101, you taught about carrots and sticks, and carrots are what we encourage people with through financial incentives to do certain things, whereas sticks are, if you don't do it, we're going to come in with the stick and we're going to regulate you. Uh, it's long known that when you have more carrots to where they actually work and encourage people to do things, that that's far more efficient than trying to just regulate something. So I've been working to bring forward tax credits on many issues like uh, conserving water through rainwater collection, protecting our, our streams and fisheries through erosion control, as well as uh, encouraging people to adopt uh, new alternative energy practices. But I also agree that it'd be great to create incentives for local hire and for pro uh, paying proper wages for people. The industry is absolutely struggling right now because it doesn't have the same benefits a lot of other industries have where they're able to write off all of their expenses, um, for instance. Uh, cannabis, because it's currently federally illegal, are not able to do that and they're not able to get banking and other types of services. So we've got a lot of work to do to try and help that industry become more viable, but mainly I try to support the local small farmers. And yes, I would support measures to try and bring forward local hire. All right, uh, Larry Doss, same question. So that that uh, industry is is um, too too young right now to force unionizing upon it, and um, I believe it's a very uh, responsible uh, form of agriculture. Uh, we have deemed it as normal agriculture in the state of California, although it is it is uh, got a lot of um, hurdles with. Uh, not being recognized by the federal government. So there's a lot of expenses that are not being able to be uh, written off by farmers, which is a huge financial burden. Uh, they are not in the place right now to uh, impose burdens on, on them. And uh, I believe the, the farmers that I met, I met quite a few, uh, they are very responsible employers. A lot of them are very small and uh, forcing um, some unionization on them at this point I think is a little premature, uh, but I'd be open to uh, always looking at it in the future. Steve Madrone, one minute. Thank you. Um, it is a young industry. And as I said, it's not federally legal yet, but that will happen in the next year or two. I think it's something like 47 states have already approved recreational and medicinal uh, cannabis usage. So it's only a matter of time. Um, and once that happens, and farms are able to write off their expenses. Most of the farmers I know, and particularly the local craft, small farmers that grow it in the sun, grow it in the ground, they care about this community. These are their homesteads and they care about their workers. They actually used to pay better wages in the illegal market before when it wasn't uh, you know, legalized. And, and that's been a big hit on the industry and the workers. So it's my belief that they do want to pay better wages, but they be, they need to be able to write those expenses off. Larry Doss, one minute. You bet. So uh, one of the issues there is is having a supervisor that's going to be a strong advocate uh, to the federal government and uh, persistent and diligent in putting the message about legalization, uh, be only, being able to bank and tax on the federal side and also enjoy the same tax benefits of write-offs as any small business owners do currently. And we are gonna to go to our next question, but I wanna also remind listeners that you can call 707-923-3911. Again, 707-923-3911 if you have a question for candidates or you can join us on the KMUD News Facebook page, live feed and type it there. Uh, we're now gonna to go to 350 Humboldt. I'll hand it over to you, Ryan.
to the public April 7th. What changes will Hi, my name is Deborah Dukes and I represent 350 Humboldt, a climate action group. Please share your thoughts regarding the draft Humboldt Regional Climate Action Plan, CAP, that was released to the public April 7th. What changes will you suggest to improve it during the EIR process? How will you encourage Humboldt County's adherence to the CAP when it is finally adopted? Thanks very much. Okay, and Larry Doss, we're going to start with you this round. But so the um, 350 Humboldt is um, has got a quite an extensive uh, list of um, of direction to to decarbonizing and um, and eliminating fossil fuels, and I I'm in agreement with their plans uh, basically. Um, there are, there are some parts of it that I, I think are maybe a little bit fast and aggressive, but, uh, I agree with it. Um, and I, and I'm going to find that, uh, or, and will demonstrate that I will work, uh, tirelessly, uh, to promote all forms of renewable energy. And, um, I feel like, uh, we will see drastic changes that direction in our near future. Uh, one size doesn't fit all though. And, um, Humboldt County has its its own intricacies of uh, especially with the transportation model, which we we've, we've talked about earlier. And Steve Madrone on 350 Humboldt's question. Yeah, again, great question. So uh, I am in full support of the draft plan and the, com the community action plan here in Humboldt. <clears throat> but what I want to do is make sure that we improve it by embedding a lot more incentives. As I said earlier in my uh, earlier points, the more carrots, the more incentives we have there to encourage those financial investments, to allow for people to be able to do the things we absolutely need to do. And I don't think there is anything that's too aggressive, frankly, because if we don't get a handle on this, climate change is real and it is coming our way in many ways like sea level rise on Humboldt Bay, along with the fact that Humboldt Bay is actually subsiding. So the land's going down, the ocean's coming up, and that means some of our sewer plants, our highways, and many things are going to be dealing with stuff. So we have to get very aggressive, but we need to do it in a way where we're rewarding people financially for doing the right thing. And I firmly believe that by doing that, we can actually electrify, we can bring on more alternative energy like solar on all homes. That's a great program. The tax credits need to be boosted back up, you know, and there's a lot of other kinds of things that we can do including forest management. I spent my whole adult career here in Humboldt, 48, 49 years working on watershed management, forest health improvements, erosion control, and doing things that will really help protect our forests, protect our water supply, and more importantly, sequester more carbon through really good forest management by encouraging our forests to older stands. Okay, Larry Doss, one minute. So I, I uh, don't disagree with what uh, Supervisor Madrone just said. I just uh, I feel like we just need to look at some of the customization to protect our rural lifestyles, and um, that that's something that I would like to see in their plan. And uh, I, I see elements of it, so I would encourage those. And um, and and I, I I like their plan. I just feel there needs to be a few adjustments. Not. Not too terribly difficult. Steve Madrone, one minute. Yeah, we uh, there are lots of things we can do to protect rural lifestyles as well as urban lifestyles and our planet. And so I'm working on a number of issues that I'm actually meeting with the Secretary of Natural Resources uh, on Thursday of this week down in Sonoma County, as well as the governor showing up for a field trip. And what we're trying to do is figure out how to incentivize, as I said, good stewardship. So I've been working on this for about 20 years. I think it's time has come. And I believe that we can do stewardship overlays with urban lands, with rural lands to help people be able to be rewarded for good stewardship of the forests and the watersheds and our climate. 
Thank you both. This next question comes from the Eureka chapter of the NAACP. Uh, they did not submit a video, but they do ask um, if you support the reallocation of funds from police departments towards community-based programs. And this one starts with you, Steve Madrone. Well, it's not so much that I support a reallocation of funds as much as I want to see funds be put into, as I said earlier, hiring trained social outreach workers to ride along with the deputies, because that's the way we really de-escalate things on the street. If you send somebody with a gun into a situation that's getting volatile, the outcome is fairly predictable. And it's not the way to keep our deputies safe, and it's certainly not the way to help people on the street. So we can do a lot better. And we have programs like the MIST program, which is a mobile outreach program. And uh, the more we add, like we just did, more funding to help folks, uh, trained folks, ride along with the deputies, then we're able to talk people down, get them into programs if they're looking for help and make that available. Whereas, you know, the approach that uh, is being used and the sheriff said, well, here's a bunch of de-escalation techniques. And they start out with, um, you know, a taser, and then they go to a baton, and then they go to a beanbag shotgun. I mean, all those are escalation techniques. And I believe that we need trained people with the deputies so that we can actually help people on the street and help them get into programs that can turn their lives around. That's how we need to focus this. Um, you know, there's a lot going on in all our communities and people want to feel safe. So I am very much a law and order uh, person. And I think that's obviously shown in the way I work with communities and trying to actually find solutions, not get into, you know, just reactionary approaches to things. Larry Doss, two minutes. You bet. Uh, the short answer to that is that I'm not in favor of reallocating uh, uh, public safety funds anywhere, but I would be in favor of adding funds to uh, programs that could help um, educate and uh, help with outreach, both from public safety, but also from organizations like the NAACP that are um, uh, can can work in a cooperative way for our uh, policing efforts, uh, but public safety uh, needs to be left alone and and possibly enhanced. I believe that uh, we have quite a few deputies that are uh, reaching and 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 pulling things together and working long hours, uh, just because it's a big county to cover, and I and I believe that we can uh, hire uh, and fill those vacant positions. That that will help. Uh, relieve some of the uh, stress. All in all, though, I'm very impressed with our local deputies and sheriff's organization, as well as local police and fire, is that we have a tremendous amount of professionals in our county that strive to be the best and provide the best service to the residents of the county, and I applaud them for that. And Steve Madrone, one minute. You know, it is an interesting balance, uh, and there are a lot of great deputies and a lot of great staff that are working on all this in DHHS and many other programs, so I have no problems with that. But there have been, been many situations where it would have been really nice to have those trained outreach workers to help de-escalate the situation. That's how you really start out de-escalating, is being able to talk people down and be trained at that. Yes, there are some deputies that have some of this training. But for the most part, they get very few hours of training in this regard in particular. And that's why I'm not trying to cut the funding to the police. What I'm trying to do is add trained people for that outreach. And Larry Doss, one minute. Uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, I'm going to protect our public services budget and try to enhance it. Um, also, uh, cooperate with the sheriff and, um, and help facilitate, if necessary, uh, training and cooperation with other organizations such as NAACP uh, to, to make all of the deputies well-rounded that, that uh, interface with the public. Okay, I think we can squeeze in one or two more questions before we go to the top of the hour. Uh, so with that, we'll go back to Ryan with the North Coast People's Alliance.
Good evening. My name is Caroline Griffith, and I am asking this question on behalf of the North Coast People's Alliance. During the pandemic, the Board of Supervisors quickly adapted to virtual meetings, opening up a new avenue of public engagement by allowing constituents to participate in meetings remotely. Though hybrid meetings, which will hopefully continue, have led to an increase in engagement, there are still many people, including working people, students whose schedules conflict with meetings, parents of young children, and residents who don't speak English as a first language, who are unable to participate in these public meetings. If elected, what will you do to make yourself available to all of your constituents and to hear their thoughts and concerns outside of Board of Supervisors meetings? Thank you. Okay, and this one goes to Larry Doss, two minutes. Thank you. So accessibility is very important. Um, uh, starting from phone calls, emails, I am already in habit of, of uh, receiving and responding to uh, hundreds of, of interactions a day in my course of business. And I plan to make sure that that's a priority uh, going forward as supervisor. And um, accessibility also runs as just being out in the community. Uh, being at uh, events, being um, very touchable and reachable. Uh, my cell phone is very public. Uh, it's going to remain that way. So um, being approachable, um, accessible, uh, reachable are, are just an easy way of doing business, doing life. And uh, that's not going to change. I would uh, be open if the rest of the supervisors wanted to, is to maybe change meeting times, I'd be okay with that if that helped a greater amount of the public to interact with the with the county supervisors. And I would also be open to even moving meeting locations if that helped. And, and it would be really nice to rotate a meeting around. Maybe we meet in Willow Creek sometime. Maybe we meet in Garberville sometime. Uh, maybe we uh, meet in Bridgeville sometime and then we come back around to Warwick. And I, I think that would be really cool to be out in the public, uh, at least as a special meeting uh, throughout the year. And Steve Madrone, same question, two minutes. Yeah, accessibility for the public is, uh, you know, really crucial. And I fought hard to bring back a, a hybrid version uh, when we started opening back up as the pan pandemic was starting to wind down. Uh, and I think the hybrid, I mean, there's a lot of positives that came from uh, the pandemic, not, not a ton, there's certainly a lot of negatives, but the positives were Zoom was one of them and also hygiene, you know, perhaps we all needed to get better at that. But the bottom line is uh, that still makes it difficult for communities uh, to access their supervisor. So before the pandemic and now that it's winding down, I have been holding office hours out in the Willow Creek area, Hoopa, and all the way up to Orleans so that the folks over in the eastern side of the county have better access to their supervisor. As I said, the fifth district is huge and the volume of calls that come in every day and the emails is so massive that it can take me a few days to get back to people. But I do that. And when I get a call or an email, I don't sit there and think, did they endorse me? Did they donate? That's just not even an issue. I do my best to respond to everybody that at least leaves a number or a message. If they call and hang up, it's hard for me to, to know what they want. But I do respond to all those messages. I'm out in the community. I spend uh, only the time I need to at my desk in Eureka for the board meetings and for other things in Eureka. Otherwise, I'm out in the fifth district, spending my time with those communities, listening to their concerns, and then responding to them and trying to help them solve problems. I don't have any other job. This is what I do. I spend my entire work week and the weekends working with the community focused on this job. And Larry Doss, one minute. I too, this is gonna be my only job moving forward as supervisor for uh, the fifth district. And uh, it goes without saying that I'll be accessible to all. And I really don't, uh, I don't care if someone endorses me or not. You're a humble resident and you've got my ear and I, I will gladly listen and give you the respect uh, that you deserve to, uh, to access a supervisor. Even if I am not your supervisor and you live out of district, I'm, I'm open to all within the county. And like I said, my cell phone is not gonna change and this is gonna be my primary job. Madrone, one minute. 
you're on mute. We'll Lips are moving and there's no noise. <laughs> it's another Zoom thing, right? Um, well, I spend a lot of my time in the community. I know this fifth district really well. I know the residents of the district. I'm familiar with the tribes. I was invited to their dances. Uh, and I try to go to every community service district meeting in the county as often as I can. I attend all of the McKinneyville service district meetings, Trinidad City Council, and many of the other districts, um, as well as attending all the various events that happen in the community. And that's often a seven day a week, you know, 12 hour a day type of a job to be able to do that. Uh, but I'm very honored to, to be asked by many people in the district to come to their events and participate. Excellent. And with that, we are reaching the top of the hour. We do have another hour left. We're going to go to the eight o'clock hour. I want to hand it over to our engineer, but I first want to let people know if you want to participate, uh, we're coming to a close on some of the nonprofit questions. And if you would like to participate, you can give us a call at 707-923-3911 or find us on Facebook. Just search KMUD News and you can type your question in our live feed. And we're going to focus the next half of this um, with questions from the audience. Um, so I'm to go ahead and hand it over to you, Javi. Thanks for engineering. Um, we'll have a five minute break. Um, let's come back at 7.05. Give us time to have some water, use the restroom. Um, we'll be right back. Thanks, Javi. Support for KMUT comes from the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, who provides services and support to the community to build energy resilience, reduce energy consumption, and expand the use of climate-friendly electric vehicles. Visit redwoodenergy.org for complete details or call 707-269-1700 for more information. And remember, folks, we are standing by. It's our spring membership drive, and we want you to go to the phones right now and not just give us your questions, but also uh, give us your membership as well. Uh, we have folks standing by to uh, take in your donations. And remember, you can always go to kema.org and give us your donation if you uh, appreciate having the, um, what are we calling this, the candidate forum uh, this evening. Let us know. This program is supported by the Redwood Palace, a full service restaurant that offers a relaxing dining experience on the Avenue of the Giants, offering a full selection of local beer and wine, Humboldt Bay oysters, cheese and charcuterie boards and dinner specials. The Redwood Palace is located in Miranda and can be reached at 707-223-5749. Menu and more online at redwoodpalacemiranda.com to go and dine in from Wednesday through Saturday, 5 to 9 p.m. And it is 7 o'clock. You got to tune to KMUD Garberville, 91.1 FM and HD1, KMUE Eureka, 88.1 FM and HD1, KLAI Laytonville, 90.3 FM, 
on the web at kma.org and FM translator K258BQ Shoulder Cove 99.5. It is 701, 58 degrees outside the studio here. And we are doing our fifth district uh, supervisor uh, candidate forum tonight uh, with uh, incumbents or incumbent um, Steve Madrone and uh, Larry Doss. And we have uh, Lauren that is uh, facilitating that. We are on a break right now, and we're going to go be going back to that in just about four minutes. Stay tuned, folks. Remember that we are in our spring membership drive, and we're standing by to take your donations and also take, to, take your questions for this uh, forum as well. And uh, you can call us at 707-923-3911. We're standing by. If you have to call back uh, maybe a couple of times because we only have one person answering the phone, um, be persistent and be patient with us. And we appreciate you participating. Okay, we are back. Good afternoon. Good evening to our listeners and to our viewers. This is Lauren Schmidt from the Cayman Newsroom. We have a special edition of Cayman News, News, a live candidate forum uh, with incumbent Steve Madrone and candidate Larry Doss for Humboldt County's fifth supervisorial district. I would like to remind our listeners that KMUD is a neutral entity and we do not endorse or promote any candidate or individual uh, political party or ideal. Uh, it is our mission to inform, educate, and inspire our listening community. So with that, we're going to go to our next question, uh, which is from the Humboldt Transition Age Youth Collaborative. And I'll hand it back over to Ryan. Hi, my name is Lucius. 
My pronouns are they, them, and I am a member of the Humboldt County Transition Age Youth Collaborations Youth Advocacy Board. Our question for you is, young people 16 to 26 experience high rates of houselessness in Humboldt County, a trend that is true across the state and nation. Concerningly, LGBTQIA plus and two-spirit youth, current and former foster youth, youth that have struggled with mental health and youth who experience racism are significantly more likely to become homeless in comparison to the general population. Part of this problem is a lack of specialized services and safe spaces, as well as the stigma and discrimination we experience searching for and maintaining housing or even just shelter. As a supervisor, what actions would you take to partner with stakeholder groups, such as those of us here, to create youth-led solutions that address the specific needs of unhoused, marginally housed, and at-risk transition age youth. And Steve Madrone, we're gonna start with you, two minutes. Thank you, um, a great question. And I use the pronouns he and him. Um, and as a member of the Behavioral Health Board, I've been working to try and make sure that our youth have more of a voice in our board and in our meetings and in our solutions. Um, you know, in so many things, if you want to fix something, well, you go to the people who are asking for help and they've got a lot of great solutions. Uh, we really need to listen to our youth. As I said, I've got four kids and 20 grandkids or actually 19 grandkids, one great can, grandkid. And so youth are really important to me. I spend a lot of time working with my family and other families to try and make sure that we increase the support that we need for specialized programs as well as safe spaces for all of our youth, no matter how they identify. Uh, this is really a big problem all over our community and all over the country and the world really. Um, and so what I'm gonna say is not a lot of words. I'm just, I'm here to help with that. I've been doing what I can within the realm of my position as a board member and speaking out and trying to support an increased voice, more programs, and being responsive to our youth, like transition, transition age youth. I've actually had a number of my grandkids that have sought out those services. And I gotta tell you, it's a fantastic program. And so many of the other things uh, that we do, you know, we've got a Hope Center as well, but that's for the adults. And we just have so limited uh, services for our youth. Our hospitals, all the things around here, don't uh, take in our youth. If, if youth are having a problem that's really serious, then often they are you know, sent uh, out of the area to Santa Rosa or somewhere else. So we've got a long way to go to improve our services for this part of our community in particular. So I'm committed to that. Larry Doss, two minutes. So uh, I, I feel like the first thing that uh, would happen in order for, for um, this subject is to is to meet and find out the priorities. I, I don't want to assume that I that I know I, I do have several friends that um, have kids that have used similar services and, and I don't know if they're the exact same, but um, lots of lots of different stories here and, and I would not want to presume that I that I know and am an ex expert of this. Um, but I, I am a great listener, and I think that uh, the ear definitely belongs to the youth because that is our future. And I, I cherish the youth both in um, education and services needed, and I'm very attentive to that. Steve Drum, one minute. Yeah, that is exactly right. We need to be meeting with the youth, and I do that with the Behavioral Health Board, but even more importantly, as a grandfather of six foster kids, I have experienced with my daughters and our families directly what services are or are not available. I hear from that community a lot about what is needed. And I've been working within my capacity to try and improve uh, our listening to those needs and making sure that we're being respectful and allowing for and incorporating and actually reaching out and embracing our youth in terms of telling us what is needed, where it's needed, and how we can get there. Larry Doss, one minute. So, so I've got a quite a history of volunteering for, for several organizations. And uh, I, I believe it was probably more than 20 years ago, 
uh, it wasn't um, the same type of names, but uh, I volunteered for a group that uh, collected uh, um, uh, listed items from youth in public that were couch surfing. And uh, that was a um, very eye-opening experience. And it uh, led me to also be involved with the Food for People program with a backpack program. And uh, several of our uh, rotary clubs within the county, as well as uh, the family uh, outreach center in McKinleyville, uh, all are involved with that. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more, learning more, and being an advocate for the youth. Okay, we're going to go to our next nonprofit question from Queer Humboldt. Hi. I'm Lark Doolin. I'm the executive director for Queer Humboldt. And our question is this, if you are elected, how will you make our community safer for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, two-spirit and queer community members, both adults and youth? And Larry Doss, we start this with you, two minutes. Great. So. Uh, I'm, I'm open again to listening here and, and see if we're missing something within the community. I believe that Humboldt generally is a very safe community. Um, and, I, and I believe we're very, very open uh, compared to other parts of the country and the world, very open to all, all backgrounds, all uh, races, all beliefs and we're very accepting. And I would like to do whatever I can to further that. And um, that's, that's just gonna take a lot of listening. And, um, and I feel like I can be up to speed fairly quick on that as supervisor. Steve Madrone, two minutes. You know, as a society, we have come a long way in the last 20 or 30 years, but frankly speaking, we have a long ways to go. And for those that identify themselves in these various categories that were mentioned, um, they don't feel safe, frankly speaking. Um, there is a lot of problems still. There's a lot of bias, a lot of prejudice. And that's not to put anybody down. It's just that we, have, we do have a long way to go to educate ourselves, to understand uh, how to be tolerant of people with different viewpoints, uh, different persuasions, and the rest of it. And there's a lot we can do. And it's absolutely true that we, the way we get there is by listening to folks that are experiencing these things and their suggestions for how we make folks uh, feel safer, but not just feel safer, actually be safer in the way that we manage our communities, how we go about treating each other, having um, you know, that tolerance, that open mind uh, for people of different persuasions. Uh, you know, there's a lot of prejudice that still occurs in our community. And I don't think it's because people want to be bad to each other. It's just a matter of educating yourself, opening your mind. And let's be honest, most of our families uh, have folks that have made these different choices about who they are and how they want to live and what orientation they want to have. So they're telling us we need to listen and we need to act and do better. Larry Doss, one minute. I, I believe we can always do better with everything. I've, I've got several clients, several family members, all that uh, are, um, are identified in, in several of the, the lists that we just heard from, from uh, Lark. And uh, I, I, I believe just showing old fashioned respect and manners is uh, what you're gonna expect from me. Stephen Drone, one minute. Tolerance, understanding, listening, acting, actually doing things that really make the lives of all of the members in our community feel safer in all of these regards. Our next question comes from Healthcare for All Humboldt Physicians for a National Health Program. Hello, my name is Patty Harvey. I am a co-director of Healthcare for All Humboldt and Physicians for a National Health Program also in Humboldt County. My question is, 
Humboldt County spends $20 million annually buying private corporate health insurance plans for its employees. Do you support a universal single payer healthcare system that would cut out private for profit middlemen health insurance companies and totally eliminate this financial burden? If not, why not? If so, what local additional benefits do you see for Humboldt County with such a healthcare system? Okay, and Steve Madrone, you'll start us off with that one, two minutes. Yeah, thanks for the question, Patty. That, that's uh, something that affects all of us, right? I mean, we're all spending a fortune on healthcare through our premiums, through our, our matching costs, uh, and then we don't even have a lot of specialists here in Humboldt County anymore uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, a big part of it is the cost of health care through the private sector um, and the profit margins and other things that happen there. Uh, so I brought forward a resolution to our board about a month, maybe six weeks ago, uh, to support health care for all in this country. And at first, it didn't look like there was full support. But in the end, we got, uh, I forget if it was a 5-0 or a 4-1. There was one individual that thought this is none of our business and the law is going to change later before it gets to its final form. So why are we weighing in now? Well, we're weighing in now because it's costing all of us a fortune. And when people say, well, how are we going to afford it? How are we going to pay for it? <laughs> all the money's already there. It's all in these premiums and the profit margins and the rest of it. So I absolutely support healthcare for all. And once we implement that, as was mentioned, the county is spending about $20 million on, health, on our current healthcare system. That money could be going towards paying down our, our liabilities on our premiums for CalPERS and, and all of our other things that are really hurting our county budgets, like roads. You know, that 20 million could go to a lot of really great things in our community instead of just going into the pockets of large corporations that don't seem to really care and they've had decades and decades and decades to make this work better. So it's high time that we pass healthcare for all. Larry Doss, two minutes. Boy, healthcare is a, is a big deal. Um, myself and my wife uh, both have, have gone without doctors now uh, for well over four, probably five years, uh, but we still pay our health insurance. and. It's, uh, if not equal, it's, it's, it's pretty darn close to our mortgage. So uh, it's, a, it's a big financial burden on us every month, but uh, we're, not, we're not receiving the benefit of it. And um, uh, I, in, in some sense, I've talked to uh, several doctors and uh, it seems to be very split. And I, and I trust that they know the systems and the ends much better than I do. And so I, I would rely on those experts to help uh, inform, guide me, and, um, and keep me up to date on, on those kind of changes. I believe we have a solution out there, and I believe that the medical uh, physicians and uh, professionals um, all, all have, are coming from different points of view, but I, I, I believe they have solutions that we can get, get on board with. And uh, I, I love the concept of of uh, healthcare for all, and um, I, I, I think there's there's something there. I just we just need to dive in and make sure it works all the way around. There, we also have opportunities to look at um, at eliminating some of the bureaucracies, and in California, that means advocating to the state on nice. alleviating alleviating some of those bureaucracies and and being a strong voice from Humboldt County to Sacramento and start start that way. Steve Madrone, one minute. Well, it's true that the medical professionals do have a lot of ideas and concepts about what, what, what might work from their perspective. But, you know, the most important perspective here is uh, all of us, you know, the people and what do the people need. And as I said before, the private sector has had decades and decades to fix this thing, but they seem to be primarily focused on profit margins. Pharmaceutical corporations seem to be focused on providing uh, things that treat symptoms but don't actually provide a healing for people because that doesn't really uh, provide all the profit that uh, treatments of symptoms bring in over a long, long period of time. So yes, I want to bring in the medical professionals, okay. but it's also true that the people have spoken and they know that we need a better system. And there are many countries who have implemented much better systems than we have. Larry Doss, one minute. 
so at, eliminating the middleman is is a big deal for me. I I uh, think we would all be very surprised to know how little uh, the doctors make on uh, on say operations and such uh, in as uh, practicing in, in a hospital setting. So uh, it's that it's that middle place, that insurance company place that again I believe we can advocate for and be a, a loud voice coming from Humboldt County, join with other counties and really shape Sacramento to not be so open to the insurance industry and back off some of those expenses right away. And I believe that could be solved quicker than, than changing the whole medical system nationally. 15 seconds. Okay. Um, these next set of questions are yes or no questions, and they come from the Redwood Coalition for Climate and Environmental Responsibility. Um, their acronym is ROCKER. Um, so, Larry, this first yes or no question is for you. Uh, do you believe Humboldt County should take action to rein in activities of businesses that are contributing to the climate crisis? Yes or no? Yes. Steve Madrone, same question. Yes, although I've changed the terms a little bit. <laughs> At any rate, no. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, I would. <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, heating homes and cooking with natural gas causes severe health impacts and contributes to the climate crisis. Do you believe Humboldt County should ban new development with gas infrastructure? Yes or no? Steve Madrone. You were uh, muted there. I didn't catch that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that's another yes. Uh, we, yeah, okay. No explanation. Yes or no, sorry. Uh, Larry Doss, same question. No. Next question. All new housing should be able to access jobs and other necessities with within 15 minutes without a car. Larry Doss, yes or no? Can you repeat that? Yeah, all new housing should be able, I think they're asking if all new housing developments should be within 15 or so minutes from um, their workplace and the grocery stores without a vehicle. Uh, I guess ideally, yes. <laughs> and uh, Steve Madron. These are fun, huh, Larry? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a yes, but obviously I think Larry and I both would put some caveats out there. <laughs> right, right. I don't know if that's uh, realistic here in Southern Humboldt, but okay, next question. This is- Exactly. <laughs> so we're the fifth district. <laughs> the, the final yes or no question. Um, the county has previously refused to restrict residential housing products production on resource zoned lands. Do you support additional restrictions on housing development on resource zone lands? Yes or no, Steve Madrone. Yeah, if you look at fires, that's a big yes. And Larry Doss. Yes. Okay, we're gonna go to one of our listeners questions here on our live feed. Um, this one comes from uh, Jessica Callahan. It is no secret that the county struggles to hire and retain medical providers. We have a serious lack of doctors. What is your plan to help our area with these issues? I'll start with you, Larry Doss. So uh, that that's always a revolving revolving door, but I believe the county would do well by incentivizing uh, young doctors coming out of medical school, help to take a burden off their uh, uh, cost of schooling and uh, in exchange for a time commitment of remaining in the county. I believe if, uh, if we kept doctors here a few more years, they too would fall in love with Humboldt County and wanna stay. Steve Madrone, two minutes. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we've all been experiencing a lack of not so much doctors, but specialists. And those include doctors, they include nurse practitioners, they include all sorts of different medical professionals that our county 
uh, has lost a lot in the last 10 or 15 years. Many of us are, most of us are heading off to Reading or Santa Rosa or San Francisco to get a lot of our medical care. And I was very curious, well, why is that happening? And we know that housing is part of that, the lack of housing, not only for uh, low income people, but for middle and upper income people is actually very limited here in Humboldt County. But the primary reason, according to the Medical Society of Humboldt County, which I met with, I meet regularly with, and I asked them, why are we seeing this shortage? And they said it was because so many of the young people coming into the medical profession don't want to open up their own firm because of the high rates of malpractice costs, both for insurance and incidents of claims. And that itself uh, has got most of the young people coming out of medical school going into clinics and hospitals, not wanting to open up their own personal uh, professional offices. So by adopting healthcare for all and helping to remove some of those barriers and by working on housing in our community for all levels of our community, we will start attracting more specialists and more medical professionals in our community. Larry Doss, one minute. So I, I believe incentivizing, looking outside the box, uh, possibly uh, creating opportunities to bring in medical in different ways. Uh, we have um, several partners within uh, private and semi-private uh, entities, even within the county that I believe we, the county could partner with and, um, and see some new possibilities. But then they're, they're again advocating against those bureaucracies like what uh, Supervisor Madrone said that the young uh, doctors coming out don't want to uh, open up their own practice. The bureaucracies are stopping that and the, the insurance companies are overwhelming. So um, we, we need to, to step past them and, and get some real solutions. And again, advocating to Sacramento, I believe is a good start. Madrone, one minute. Yeah, well, um, as I said, I've been endorsed by Senator McGuire, Assemblyman Wood, and Congressman Huffman. So I have developed the relationships with our state and federal officials, which you need to do to be able to move forward and get things done, basically. Um, so that's a big part of it. And I'm working hard on the housing part of that picture, uh, as well as other um, reforms like health care for all. Um, also, our medical professionals are really um, struggling with the pandemic, as well as it's gotten far more dangerous in the ERs and everything. And that's dealt with by working with people that are having issues and helping them get into programs to help our medical professionals feel safe and be safe. Okay, this next question, we'll start with you, Steve Madrone. Uh, this comes from one of our listeners um, in regards to water in Northern Humboldt. Are you willing to work with the Trinidad Rancheria and Humboldt Bay Water? instead of creating small districts? Yeah, another great question. So yes, I am. I have made it very clear, both in writings in the paper and with direct communications with the Trinidad Rancheria, that I would absolutely support reasonable development on the Rancheria that fits within the site and its environmental constraints and fits within the community as a whole. Um, and I don't believe that's a five or six story hotel. And I don't believe that an interchange paid for by public monies is something that we ought to really be considering. And yet that's what's happening. So yes, I have worked hard uh, to try and work with the Rancheria on what I consider to be reasonable development that is supported by not only many Rancheria members, but also many in the community surrounding the Rancherias. And I'm a big proponent of uh, resilient water supplies. I was a big help to the city of Trinidad and West Haven in getting over $12 million in the last month for helping improve their water resiliency, to replace storage tanks, to work on fixing leaks in the pipes. Trinidad was losing 30, 40% of their water, and as well as doing groundwater recharge and forest health thinning to help recharge our groundwater. I'm a big proponent of trying to live within your means and working with the water resources that are available to you. One of the problems with the pipeline coming to the Rancheria from the Mad River is that it would absolutely be a growth inducing element that the majority of the community don't want to see happen. Um, they want to try and maintain uh, the beautiful community they have. And uh, I support that. And so that's why I've been working with the West, West Haven Community Service District 
the Trinidad City Council and with the Rancheria where they're willing to try and work on water resiliency and um, rainwater storage, things like that. Larry Doss, two minutes. You bet. I'm in full support of Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District running water up to, uh, uh, boy, I'd love to see it go all the way up the old highway, Patrick's Point Drive, um, as far as we could go. One of the reasons is uh, just fire safety ISO ratings, which is the insurance standard uh, uh, that, that determines uh, safe communities for fire safety and, and having hydrants that you can depend on are very important. Um, there, I believe uh, running public water uh, is a good stewardship of the, the uh, ecosystems. Uh, I understand that last year, uh, the Trinidad uh, uh, water system was in jeopardy of, of uh, possibly running dry. And luckily we had an early rain to charge the system. That's not, that's not good for the ecosystems up there when we have uh, municipal water at hand and is, is very uh, reliable, safe, and it helps the environment. So um, helping the ecosystems, uh, being good stewards, bringing up hydrants, it's not gonna cause growth. There's so many other layers of bureaucracy that will impose less growth on, on that part of the county that uh, bringing water up there is not gonna, not gonna change that. And then uh, lastly, uh, in 2029, the state of California will reevaluate the water rights for the Mad River. And that's going to help protect our water rights by showing commercial users and more residential users. Steve Madrone, one minute. Well, this is certainly one area where Larry and I differ quite a bit, but that may be because he's a real estate agent and I'm a watershed management uh, professional. But the bottom line is that it will increase growth. It's well known, you can Google it. Whenever communities bring in a pipeline for water, just that alone will increase uh, development tremendously. And there's a couple of real estate agents in the Trinidad area. Patty Stearns is one of them, I wrote a very detailed letter about how uh, a pipeline would absolutely increase growth in the area. And yes, there are other laws, but the bottom line is if you no longer have a well and a septic system on the same parcel, you can probably increase the density on that parcel. It has to do with septic capacity and things like that. So uh, we differ a lot on that. And I am a proponent of working within our means, within the watershed, increasing our resilience, doing more rainwater collection, fixing leaks, storing water municipally, as well as at the home level with rainwater collection. Just in the nick of time. Uh, Larry Doss, one minute. Yeah, I'm going to stand on uh, promoting the Humble Bay Municipal Water District extension. I firmly believe uh, that it will not cause growth. Growth is going to happen, and we need to uh, we need to understand that growth is going to happen everywhere in California. There's not going to be a community that can be immune to it, so we need to be smart about it. And I trust that the bureaucracies in place will keep the growth from getting out of control everywhere, but also especially in the Trinidad. Uh, and West Haven areas. So water, safe water is very important, reliable water. All right, another question from the community and this is gonna to go to you, uh, Larry Doss. Um, did you receive the COVID-19 vaccine? Why or why not? And can you share your thoughts on the county's response to the pandemic? No, I did not receive the vaccine and uh, uh, I, I believe that a lot of those issues need to still remain personal to people. And I respect those that choose not to uh, answer their medical questions. We've, we've thrown a lot of our, our medical, which we've, uh, we've taken as, as a um, strong measures to be private and we've uh, aired them out to the public. And I, and I believe that every individual has their own uh, right to choice for their health. And um, I chose not to take a vaccine. Uh, although we vaccinate uh, cattle every year and I know uh, there's a COVID strain in one of those shots and I've, I've given myself that shot 50, 60 times over the years. So I don't think it's the same COVID. In fact, I know it's not I'm just kind of being a little funny. 
Um, but uh, I, I believe we, we keep our medical, uh, have the right to keep our medical choices private and I'll, I'll stand to protect that. Steve Madrone, two minutes. Yes, I did uh, receive uh, the vaccine as well as a booster. And I think the county's response was good. I mean, this is a big, a really big issue for our communities. And I do respect folks' uh, choice. You know, they can choose one way or another uh, what they prefer to do. Um, you know, I think that uh, this was one of the most difficult things that I've seen in my adult life, uh, almost a little bit like a sci-fi movie on TV. I don't think any of us ever thought it'd get quite so, so gnarly, frankly. Um, so yes, I did get vaccinated and I got a booster. Everyone in my family did, my grandchildren eventually did once that was available to the youth. Uh, but we also practiced all the other things, isolation, distancing, masking, uh, as well as hygiene. I, I think these are all ways that we have helped keep our own community safer to try and, as they say, slow the spread and to knock it down. And yeah, nothing's perfect. It's just like a seatbelt in a car. It doesn't necessarily mean you're not gonna get injured, but your chances of being less injured or not dying are, are far superior with a seatbelt. So I kind of looked at it that way and decided that it was a good thing to do for the community, for myself. And a lot of it was looking at what was happening in our hospitals for our healthcare workers who are just frankly being completely overwhelmed you know, with, with people coming in, literally dying. And you know, the numbers speak very loudly. When you look at all the data, yes, there are some bad examples bad reactions that happen here or there. But when you look at the data as a whole and you listen to responsible uh, reports on this, you will see that the vast number of deaths and illnesses happened for those folks that were not vaccinated. So I try to look at the science. I am a scientist. And I also try to you know, look at a broad picture of what's going on and make a choice that I think is not only responsible for me and my family, but for the whole community. Oh, once again, nick of time. Uh, Larry Doss, one minute. Oh, Larry, you're muted. Well, looking at the science has definitely become uh, defined differently over the last two years. And um, I am uh, I am still going to stand on uh, the medical privacy, uh, uh, all of the hygiene and prevention uh, we followed. And um, I don't believe that uh, there's still um, enough evidence out there that the, the shots, any of the shots have been studied uh, well enough to, uh, for me to trust going to get one. Steve Madrone, one minute. Well, I don't know. We've got hundreds of millions of uh, test uh, samples of people that have taken these vaccinations, hundreds of millions. Right, and we can see the results from that. So we absolutely have gotten a lot of scientific data about this. I realize it was rolled out fast. Uh, that was really quite amazing. But it, you know, and I absolutely respect people's private choices. But this is also a public matter of keeping everybody as safe as we possibly can. And as I said before, what about our medical professionals in the hospitals, in the ER room? Uh, it was just so, so horrible and difficult for them. And I think we have to look at these kinds of things in the big picture. All right. Um, this next question I goes to you, Steve Madrone. Um, the Humboldt County cannabis economy is collapsing. What strategies have you devised to help um, this critical aspect of Humboldt County's economy? Yeah, another great question. So what I've done is uh, within three months of getting on the Board of Supervisors, I discovered that the Measure S tax, the tax on uh, cultivation in Humboldt County, was actually being charged on people before they even grew it. So looking at that, that seemed incredibly unfair. So I was able to get a 5-0 vote from my board to move that out a whole year. That gave every cannabis farmer a year buffer. It didn't take the tax away, but it gave them a whole year that they didn't have to pay that tax. And the tax was then levied after they grew. I think Measure S is still very problematic and needs to go away. It would be so much better to put that cost on the uh, dispensaries, on the end product, because the consumer is already paying that price. But to put it on the farmer is very unfair. They're already struggling with production and low value. 
and they really need all the help we can get. Additionally, from the day I got on the board, I've been working to try and bring forward tax credits for converting to solar or small hydro, for doing better job on the roads to control sediment, to keep it out of our water supplies and to protect our fisheries, as well as helping people convert over to uh, alternative energy, which I, I said, but also to rainwater collection and uh, water storage and forbearing from pumping from the creeks in the summertime. I continue to support those measures. I'm gonna continue to bring them forward. Uh, I also supported a tax reduction for the farmers, not nearly what they had hoped for. And I understand that they're struggling, I really do. But I had a lot of people that were asking me, so where's my tax deduction? And I would point out to them that the cannabis industry doesn't get to write off their expenses. They didn't get CARES Act, they didn't get ARPA. So it's a very unique situation. And I think there's a lot we can do to incentivize the small farmers in our community to be the craft market that we always imagined Humboldt to be like Napa wine. We've got a ways to go to get that done. Okay, Larry Doss, two minutes. So uh, I have learned quite a bit uh, about this industry and, um, and a couple of things uh, seem like real uh, rather quick or easier uh, solutions that could be attacked through advocating uh, from a supervisor level. One is uh, going after the illegal importation of cannabis from uh, both North and South and uh, look at also um, going after the illegal dispensaries. It, there, there's quite a bit of competition that is, that is muddied and, um, and, and lowered the value of, of cannabis in California. And um, I grew up with a, an agricultural background and a similar tax was in place for my grandparents uh, in the stone fruit uh, business, uh, plums and apricots. Uh, the, the, um, at that time, back in the 70s, they were taxed on every tree or even stump. And so uh, I spent a lot of time as, as a little kid wrapping chains around dead trees and pulling them out of the ground because the county was going to charge grandpa quite a bit of money for a, a dead tree. So we don't tax on potential we tax, just like any other normal business. The only um, the only place of tax uh, should occur is upon sale and income. So advocating to the IRS, seconds. Ab advocating to the IRS for uh, legalizing both for banking purposes that'll bring safety in and normal business write-offs uh, will make big, big changes in direction and advocating also for special events and such. Eamon Drone, one minute. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, what I think we need to be doing is supporting local, smaller farmers, uh, in particular those that are doing regenerative farming. And as I said earlier, I am continuing to work on and have met with Senator McGuire and Assemblyman Wood to try and bring forth tax credits at the state level. In fact, I'm making a presentation on that down in Sonoma County, as I said, this Thursday with the Secretary for Resources, a program where we would reward good stewardship and provide tax incentives for that. Uh, and a lot of that's gonna be getting the federal government to eventually legalize it so folks can write off their expenses and get the other benefits that all other businesses get. Larry Doss, one minute. So there's, there's several things we can cooperate with as a community and uh, as a county, um, but really we're talking about agriculture and just having the plain respect that this is an agricultural uh, venture uh, and they are due the same respect tax-wise and banking-wise as any other business or agriculture venture in the country. And this next one, I believe, will be our final question before we share your outros. Um, we did have a listener call to ask if you think um, local volunteer firefighters should be unpaid volunteers or should there be a source of funds um, to support local volunteer fire departments? Larry Doss, two minutes. There, there needs to be something. We, we uh, are hurting in the volunteer fire department area. Um, our volunteer fire department's primarily out in the extreme rural parts of the county, um, cover an awful lot of responsibility 
in some cases, uh, more responsibilities than uh, urban fire uh, departments do. So I, I would be in favor of some sort of incentive uh, for volunteer departments, and maybe the county should even step up and uh, help convert those into uh, uh, cro uh, crosses of part volunteer, part paid. Um, there's uh, several several hundred miles of uh, highways that the state runs through just in the fifth district alone that volunteer fire departments have responsibilities for, for medical aid and accident um, uh, recoveries and um, responses. And uh, those to me look like um, unfunded mandates really from, from the state. Uh, they, they need help, we need to be supporting them more. And um, it sure means an awful lot when, when you're calling for help and there is a fire uh, truck, emergency personnel and ambulance that are within a reasonable distance to, to helping. Dean Madron, two minutes. Well, another critical issue in our communities, um, you know, the volunteer fire departments are really struggling just even getting volunteers because of all the short-term rentals in the county. So this is an issue that we're going to be bringing forth to the board to try and deal with, because if all of our homes are converting to short-term rentals, we don't have the people to fill the positions in these volunteer fire departments. Uh, getting them to having paid staff would be a good measure. But right now, a lot of them are just struggling with getting a, a new uh, new shop, a new barn, a new fire hall to store their new Measure Z equipment to get it out of the rain. Um, and it's really those local volunteer fire part departments that positively affect our ISO ratings. It's not CAL FIRE, but I've also worked hard to support CAL FIRE in the Trinidad area and in my district. But I was able to get $85,000 of unspent uh, funding uh, in our um, are uh, one of the areas up there by West Haven to be able to go to the West Haven Fire Department. They were trying to survive off of Blackberry Pie Festivals. The pandemic put a stop to that. And so basically, you know, I was able to help them get significant funding. I also helped the Orleans Volunteer Fire Department extend their timeline on their contract so they could complete their fire hall. And I showed up with my tool belt to work on the crew to help make that happen. So yeah, we do need to provide a lot more support for our volunteer fire departments to help them be whole. They help us with ISO ratings. And as I said, helping CAL FIRE in my community actually helped about 30 to 40 people in the West Haven area get more insurance or keep their insurance. So, you know, ISO ratings come from volunteer fire departments, which are structural firefighting. CAL FIRE is wildland. So it really is those volunteer departments that help us keep our insurance. Larry Doss, one minute. Yeah, the, the Amador contract that Cal Fire has uh, in the Trinidad station is, I believe, the second oldest in the state. And that really fills the gaps in the fifth district. Um, and it, and it uh, in some cases, probably gives us a false sense of security when it comes to uh, the fire service in the fifth district. Uh, I, I really believe this is a, this is a tough issue as as uh, folks uh, assume they, they can pick up a phone and get uh, a fire truck to respond um, with, with a appropriate crew in a timely manner. Um, I, I believe that that is, um, it's not so right now. And, and we need to put a lot of attention to uh, emergency services in our, in our rural communities. And Stephen Joan, one minute. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the firefighters are at the heart of our communities. And as I said, we need to be able to deal with short term rentals so that we actually maintain a lot of a good population in our communities that can bring forth volunteers to work on this. But when we provide them with the kind of funding to have up to date air systems, up to date equipment and safety measures, that's how we attract more volunteers to work on these departments and work in our community. It's a dangerous job. We know that and it's unpaid. So there are a lot of ways we can support our volunteer fire departments. In the fifth district, we're looking at possibly trying to consolidate some services. Uh, there's a big area out there in Redwood Valley that sits kind of halfway between Blue Lake and uh, out in Willow Creek. 
Um, so we're looking at how do we increase funding for these departments, as well as how do we make sure we get more volunteers coming to, uh, to help in that arena. And we are gonna have you both share your final thoughts and we're gonna give you each four minutes to do so, uh, starting with you, Supervisor Madrone. Well, I wanna thank all of the nonprofits that came forth with questions tonight. You know, nonprofits are a huge piece in our community. They really keep us whole with all the volunteering work that they do, along with volunteer fire departments and so many other people in our community. So my, uh, my applause go out to them. Um, there's a lot we've got to do. You know, this is perhaps one of the brightest futures we're looking at in Humboldt in a long time with the potential for a lot of uh, good projects coming um, on, on the horizon. And with Cal Poly Humboldt, you know, there's going to be a housing crunch. So we're going to really need to up our ante on getting more housing built. All of these things can create a lot more jobs, living wage jobs, and I'm very much a, a, a supporter of um, living wage and local hire. And, you know, I'm working with unions to see if we can get the apprenticeship halls running again with all these various projects that are coming on the horizon. So I'm going to continue to build bridges with people in the community uh, that may not look like me or think like me. Uh, but I'm sure because of the experiences I've had in Humboldt and the successes I've had that we can find common ground. Uh, I helped start the Trinidad Bay Watershed Council that brings all the stakeholders to the table to try and solve the problems of pollution in, in Trinidad Bay for our fisheries. And I'm proud to say that in the last 12 years or so, we've brought in over 15 million plus the new 12 million for Trinidad and West Haven. You know, we're over $20 million that have come into that community because we came together as a community, put our differences aside and worked on our common ground to move forward to support our community as a whole. So I am committed as your supervisor to being a bridge builder, working with people of all persuasions. I think we make a, a lot better decisions on our board when we have a diversity of opinions on our board that can bring all the various different experiences to the table, find that common ground, and actually move forward on solutions that benefit everybody in our community. I'm committed to listening to everyone in our community. Please call me email me, ask me for help. I am there for you. I know it might take a little bit of time, a few days to get back to you, but I will. And uh, you know, I'm committed to returning all those calls and all those emails. Uh, this is an exciting time for us, I think, in Humboldt County. There's a lot to do. Uh, I encourage everybody to get out and vote. I would be very honored to have your vote on June 7th. And you know, the mail-in ballots are going to everybody. So they're coming out on May 9th. That's just like a week away or so. So please get out and vote uh, for whoever you prefer, but you know, get out and vote and be engaged in our community. Come to our meetings, submit questions like tonight. This has been a great community service uh, by KMUD and I wanna thank them and please donate to KMUD because what would we do without KMUD? A great, great nonprofit here in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve Madrone and Larry Doss. Your final thoughts, four minutes. You bet. And as, as a supervisor, there's things that you can count on for me. You're going to count on a high level of integrity, a diligent uh, work ethic, and I will be respectful for, to all, my ears open to all. And I, it doesn't matter whether you uh, endorsed me or not. Uh, we're all humble, we're all together. And uh, uh, we all have the common love of Humboldt County. I, I wanna work diligently to protect our rural lifestyle and balance that with smart growth. Affordable housing is very attainable on many levels from uh, rental to ownership. I've, I've got solutions for all of that, as well as I've been in touch with many people that we become friends that, uh, they're, they're homeless and they've been very insightful to me on uh, giving me um, different ideas to look at from their perspective. So all perspectives, all voices matter to me. And um, I'm, I'm just really excited to, to get to work. And uh, there's a lot of solutions to a lot of problems with uh, people have, have shared with me visiting with 
uh, fifth district residents for the last, though, I don't know, six or six or eight months. Uh, there's um, uh, a lot of issues. A lot of issues can be easily solved. And uh, I'm going to work hard for you. I'm going to I'm going to be your advocate and I'm going to be open to your calls and emails. And uh, you're, you know, a, a humble person is a priority in my mind. I've I've gone to extra lengths to to be fully committed. I I've um, agreed to uh, bring on partners with my business and and eventually step away uh, with the intent of being supervisor. So my my sole um, activities, my my sole uh, extent of of um, focus is going to be on making Humboldt better, doing smart smart growth, smart changes. Um, uh, helping our environment, helping safe water, public safety. Um, it, it's all right there. There's, there's definitely places where we can increase our wildfire safety through prevention and, and we can get real, real solutions for the shelter and security out there. I, um, I'm, I'm excited about doing this. I, I don't um, have any re regrets or hesitation. I'm going to go full head. I'm lean hard into this job and I, I look forward to a lot of pleasant outcomes for many many people going forward um, I, I bring a lot of experience to the table from two elected positions in my history uh, so I've got good background with within the county in elected positions um, I've got I've owned two successful businesses and I've made hundreds and thousands of relationships already um, through all of those activities. And I plan on plugging in and leveraging all of that uh, to benefit Humboldt County. So I, I love Humboldt uh, and I, I have a deep passion for Humboldt and uh, I'm looking to, to, uh, to protect Humboldt but also move forward smartly. And uh, 30, seconds. 30 seconds. I, uh, I, I again, thank you for the time. I'd be honored to have your vote and I look forward to being the next fifth district supervisor to serve you. Well, thank you very much, candidate Larry Doss and incumbent Steve Madrone. Uh, this has been KMUD News' live candidate forum with those in the bidding for Humboldt County's fifth supervisorial district. I've been your host, Lauren Schmidt. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. And if you are tuning in late or want to catch this again, you can do so on www.kmud.org and check our archive starting at 6 p.m. this Monday evening. Or if you're on the Facebook, you can visit the KMUD news page uh, where you'll find a video and audio of this and more. I would like to very much thank our engineer Javier Rodriguez, our tech support Ryan Christensen, our timekeeper Stella Gerkins being shy, uh, and Caroline Griffin for helping to organize uh, this amazing forum. And again, thank you both very much. KMUD is in a pledge drive. So if you uh, found this very helpful in trying to make an informed vote, please go to KMUD.org and click the blue donate now button. Thank you very much. Javi, back to you in the studio. Bye. <laughs>